Welcome everyone. I'm Clark and I'm the producer of this channel. I'm from Lehigh, Utah. I started Study My Gospel to provide another resource of online gospel learning. I partner with professional gospel instructors for our various series, including Come Follow Me, Gospel Topics, and more to come. If you like the content, please subscribe. Enjoy the video. Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. As we look at 3 Nephi 27 to 4 Nephi chapter 1, we live in difficult times. It's a time of violence, riots, discord, division. There are challenges that are happening to us socially and economically. And as I read through these chapters in the Book of Mormon, my heart just focused on 4 Nephi. And I kind of wished and longed for a day when we could all say that everyone around us was converted to the Lord, that there was no contentions, no disputations among us, that everyone dealt justly with each other, kind of a Zion-like society, Zion-like city, Zion-like nations. And then I started thinking in 4th Nephi, there's so little detail on what they did to make that society happen. I would love to see some hear some of the talks to be able to read some of the things that the, the disciples said and some of the things they did to make the society the way it was. But then I thought, really, we have the blueprint for that society. One of the questions often raised about Mormon's abridgment is, why is 4th Nephi such a brief book, with only four pages covering a period of 285 years? A corollary question is, if, during the first 166 years after the visit of Christ the Nephites, there could not have been a happier people. Why do we not have a much more detailed record of their, their recipe for righteousness? A partial answer may be found in the fact that 3rd Nephi does contain this recipe for righteousness. 4th Nephi then records the natural consequences of righteousness as they walk after the commandments which they had received from their Lord and their God. And there was no contention in the land because of the love of the people of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. So I thought about that recipe of righteousness. And maybe that's a little bit of a theme that I'm taking from really 3rd Nephi into 4th Nephi. And I think it starts with the blueprint on which they build their lives. It's the way that they have their life. It's their lifestyle, which is found on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And 3rd Nephi 27, Christ says that. He explains that. This has to be the foundation. Behold, I have given unto you my gospel. And this is the gospel which I have given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of the Father, because my Father sent me. And my Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. And after I have been lifted up upon the cross, that I might draw all men unto me. And I pause there, noting that often when Christ talks about his experience in his atoning sacrifice, he refers to it as his cross. And we get that again here in Third Nephi. Sometimes we avoid talking about the cross as a symbol of Christ's atonement when it is just as appropriate as we would talk about Gethsemane, for Christ uses it himself as that symbol. The cross, Gethsemane, draw us to Christ because it draws us to become more like him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel, and ye know the things that ye must do in my church. For the works which ye have seen me do, that shall ye do also. For that which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do. I think the recipe for righteousness just starts by us being built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Christ also talks about his church as a part of that recipe. And sometimes you ask, well, what's in the name of the church? Now, I just pause for a minute. My wife, her name is Louise. Her name means warrior woman. You talk about what's in a name, I married to Warrior Woman, which is kind of fun to see because she's such a kind of person. But it is something that's interesting with the name of a church. And that seems to be what the disciples, or not the disciples, the people, are disputing about. We see that in our day today. You think, how many Christian churches are in the United States alone? The answer is, there is more than 4,000, 41,000. Christian churches in the United States alone. And so when Christ comes down 
and says, Behold, I say unto you, why is it that the people should murmur and dispute about this thing? For him, it's kind of a little bit obvious. If it's going to be Moses' church, name it after Moses. It's my church, name it after me. And I love what he says in verse 7. Ye shall call upon the Father in my name that he will bless the church for my sake. That's a great invitation that sometimes maybe we don't do as well to call upon the Father to bless the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not for our sake, but for his sake. In the process of taking the Savior's name upon us, we must understand that the cause of, or, of Christ and of his church are one and the same. They cannot be separated. Similarly, our personal discipleship to the Savior and active membership in his church are also inseparable. If we falter in our commitment to one, our commitment to the other will be diminished, as surely as night follows day. President Russell M. Nelson has encouraged us recently to use the full name of the church. He asked the same question. What's in a name? Or, in this case, a nickname? When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as the LDS Church, the Mormon Church, or the Church of the Latter-day Saints, the most important thing in those names is the absence of the Savior's name. To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan. When we discard the Savior's name, we are subtly disregarding all that Jesus Christ did for us, even his atonement. My dear brothers and sisters, I promise you that if we will do our best to restore the correct name of the Lord's church, he whose church this is will pour down his power and blessings upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints, the likes of which we have never, we will have never seen. We will have the knowledge and power of God to help us take the blessings of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and to prepare the world for the said coming of Christ. Part of the recipe of righteousness is that we pray that the Father will bless the church for Christ's sake, and I think also for ours too. The church blesses us, and our service blesses those around us. Another part of the recipe of righteousness is just noting in chapter 7, verse, verse 1, the disciples were gathered together, and they were united in mighty prayer and fasting. I love that they were united in that mighty prayer and fasting. When we are united in mighty prayer and fasting, the Spirit more readily comes to our heart and our mind, helps us to answer difficult questions and encourage us and to continue to have our foundation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Elder McConkie shared several years ago a time when the apostles were gathered together in mighty prayer and fasting. He said, I thought since our united prayer must have been like that of the Nephite disciples, the Lord's twelve in that day, and for the people who were gathered together and were united in mighty prayer and fasting, to learn the, the name that the Lord had given to his church. In their day, the Lord came personally to answer their petition. In our day, he sent his spirit to deliver the message. And as it was with our Nephite brethren of old, so it was with us. We too had come together in the true spirit of worship and with unity of desire. We were all fasting, and there was a marvelous outpouring of unity, oneness, and agreement in counsel. It was during that prayer that the revelation came. The Spirit of the Lord rested mightily upon us all. We felt something akin to what happened on the day of Pentecost and at dedication of the Kirtland Temple. From the midst of eternity, the voice of God, conveyed by the power of the Spirit, spoke to his prophet. Part of the recipe of righteousness is that we are united in mighty prayer and fasting to know the will of the Lord in things, mighty prayer and fasting for others, for our family, and for us. Another part of the recipe of righteousness is part of what Christ asks. He asks, What manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. We become what we want to be by consistently being what we want to become each day. Righteous character is a precious manifestation of what you are becoming. Righteous character is more valuable than any material object you own, any knowledge you have gained through study, or any goals you have attained no matter how well lauded by mankind. In the next life, your righteous character will be evaluated to assess how well you use the privilege of mortality. And I have found that President Nilsen, or President Benson's summary of this is so accurate. Whether it's a man or a woman, they are the greatest and most blessed and joyful whose life most fitly, closely fits the pattern of the Christ. This has nothing to do with earthly wealth, power, or prestige. 
the only true test of greatness, blessedness, joyfulness, and how close a life can come to being like the Master Jesus Christ. He is the right way, the full truth, and the abundant life. The recipe for righteousness is every day just striving to be a little bit more like Christ, to come unto Him, to become as He has. And it's a process that takes a long time. We never get there in this life. Can't expect that at all. But we just try and strive today to do a little better. I'm often fascinated by having the Savior ask the 12 disciples, what do you want? And I'm thinking, if I could ask the Savior one thing, what would it be? There's a part of me that's like those 12, or the 9, that says, uh, I kind of want to come back to you. Think of the confidence that you could have knowing, Christ just gave me that, you got the ticket. But there's also a part of me, and I think maybe all of us, who can relate to these three, where their desire is to serve. Their desire in chapter 28 of 3 Nephi is to minister and keep ministering. It's just to help out. A lot of times our focus becomes on kind of the changes that happens to the three Nephites, to their bodies. And I think it's appropriate to maybe compare with Scripture uh, verses. Here is what it's like to be transfigured. Here's what it's like to be the translation. And here's a resurrection. Some of those, like Mount Transfiguration, gives a great example of what transfiguration is, or Moses chapter 1, or Doctrine and Covenants 67. Translated, um, this is Doctrine and Covenants 7, section 107, 2 Kings chapter 2, or, as Elder McConkie is going to say, part of the three Nephites, and the greater change which comes to all of us, resurrection. Elder McConkie explained, some mortals have been translated. In this state, they are not subject to sorrow or to disease or to death. No longer does blood, the life-giving element of our present mortality, flow in their veins. Procreation ceases. If they then had children, their offspring would be denied a mortal probation, which all worthy spirits must receive in due course. They have power to move and live in the, both a mortal and an unseen sphere. All translated beings undergo another change in their bodies when they gain full immortality. This change is equivalent to a resurrection. All mortals, after death, are also resurrected. In the resurrection, resurrection state, they are immortal and eternal in nature, and those among them who are privileged to live in the family unit have spirit children. Millennial man will live in a state akin to translation. His body will be changed so that it is no longer subject to disease or death as we know it, although he will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to full immortality when he is a hundred years of age. He will, however, have children, and mortal life of a millennial kind will continue. So just a summary for me with the recipe of righteousness. These 12 uh, Nephite are among them to minister. Part of that recipe of righteousness is that we have prophets and apostles that minister us today. We don't have to rely on God's word to them back then, but it's to us today. Another part of the recipe of righteousness is I love Christ's example once again of ministering one by one. Now I'm just going to give one idea of teaching for these chapters because we've spent so much time really on the theme of the recipe of righteousness and why ask, why make the recipe in the first place? It's, it's like cookies for me. There are some cookie dough and cookies that I just love. But if I don't love it, why make it? I think the answer for this is what you taste. We have a taste of joy, and Christ says, as a part of this reading, is this recipe of righteousness leads to a fullness of joy. That's really what it's all about. We can taste that joy as we follow the recipe of righteousness in our life today. But there's also a question that the Lord, or the things that the Lord does that made me really ponder and think. As he's there, he says that my joy is great even unto fullness, because of you. The recipe of righteousness, I think, leads to Christ being a little bit more joyful because of who we are becoming. We're becoming closer to him, and we are more joyful. I hope you have a joyful day today. Keep smiling. Bye.